Good. Hello, good morning, everyone. And welcome to our 10th webinar of the Forest Restoration Talks. So these talks are organized jointly by SUPER and EU Fruit Task Force, Transforming Forest Landscape for Future Climate and Human Wellbeing. As you know, our talks target researcher, practitioner, NGO, policymaker, and all interested stakeholders in uh, working on, on restoration. We investigate forest restoration from diverse scientific perspective, alternating focus on global and European level. And our, um, our talk today is on new standards of practice to guide ecosystem restoration, views from science and practice. Before handing it to Andreas to present our speakers, I will start with some um, housekeeping rules. So just to remind you that the webinars are recorded. So if you don't agree, you can just express and you can watch them later uh, on EFI YouTube or in UFRO website. After the talk, or when the question is um, are requested, you can put your question on the Q and A box, and then you will be promoted at some point. You will receive a message from Priscilla to promote you as a speaker. So you can open your camera and mic and ask your question live. And if you will be tweeting or uh, communicating via um, um, online. You can use our, you can tag EUFRO and, uh, and SUPERB. So now I will hand it over to Andreas to present our speakers. I wish you a good webinar. Hello to everybody also from my side. I'm really glad and proud more or less uh, to have now our panelists on the scene. We have two really very exciting um, speakers today. The first one is George Gann. George is a plant botanist and vegetation ecologist, uh, eco ecologist and he's also a specialist in uh, yeah, plant or ecosystem conservation and restoration. So um, he earned a, a Bachelor of Arts in 1984 at the University of Colorado. And a bit later on, he founded Eco Horizons, which is a private environmental consulting <coughs> company or firm in Miami and in Florida. And uh, he was included a really a huge bunch of, of projects uh, on floristic inventories um, and also um, investigations on rare species. And um, in 2010, he became director of the Jiminy Botanical Garden, which, is, which uh, they are, has the, one of the largest collection of Caribbean plants. And um, in 1995, he became also executive, executive director of the Institute of Regional Conservation, and later on also its president and, and board chair. And so he's huge, he has a huge experience in several conservation projects and so on. And so he, I think, is a perfect, um, you know, he, he um, is, is a or has a perfect and, and mixed, a uh, good mixture of. Uh, both scientific but also practical experience and all the kind of um, the, um, ecological restoration. So he is now um, also in charge of the so Society of Ecological Restoration, SER, and he is also now uh, international political head of the, this organization. So I'm really glad to have you here, George, and we are uh, really uh, keen to hear your presentation. So the floor is yours. Thanks. Thanks so much. All right, I'm going to share my screen here. There we go. All right. Can you see everything fine? Yes, everything's fine. All right, perfect. All right, so for this part of the uh, webinar, I put together this talk on emerging principles and standards to support ecosystem and ecological restoration. And um, and I'm, I'm uh, giving this presentation as international policy lead for SER. And as Andrea said, I'm also a, a restoration practitioner. Um, and uh, 
So looking at this from both of those perspectives, uh, how to develop global policy and standards and principles and so forth that also are practical on the ground, because if they're not practical on the ground, they don't do us a whole lot of good. So the first thing we wanna do is uh, most of us are aware that we're in the UN decade on ecosystem restoration, uh, 2021 to 2030. And I wanna start by talking about some contributions from the UN decade on ecosystem restoration best practices task force. So SER and the IUCN Commission on Ecosystem Management and the Best Practices Task Force that's head by the FAO um, have been working on a series of guidance documents. And the first one was issued in 2021, the Principles for Ecosystem Restoration to Guide um, the UN Decade. And um, the second, the Standards of Practice to Guide Ecosystem Restoration, the summary version was issued last fall in, um, in concert with the CBD COP. And then just two weeks ago, we uh, we launched the early release version of the SOPs at SER 2023 in Darwin, Australia. So the first document, the, the principles for the UN decade, um, uh, there are 10 principles that have been agreed and they, they range uh, across a whole spectrum of, of issues from making sure that um, projects align with the UN Sustainable Development Goals, that um, restoration is inclusive and has participatory govern governance, that restoration includes a continuum of, of re restorative activities. We'll look at that a little bit more um, in a second. Um, that we aim for the highest level of recovery that is possible, that we address causes of degradation, that we incorporate all knowledge, uh, that we use well-defined, short, medium and long-term goals and objectives to make sure that restoration projects are tailored to local ecological, social, and socioeconomic contexts while taking the broader landscape or seascape into account, um, that we include monitoring and adaptive management, and that we have enabling policies. So that's just a brief look at those principles, but they underpin the rest of the work that comes. So one of the things that's really important to take into consideration when we're thinking about the, the UN decade on ecosystem restoration is what is ecosystem restoration? How does it relate to ecological restoration? So this figure is adapted from that in the SER 2019 standards uh, of practice um, for um, ecological restoration. And the idea is that there's a whole lot of things, different kinds of things that we can do across a restorative continuum from reducing impacts to remediation and rehabilitation, ecological restoration. And SER is mostly concerned with things along the right-hand side, but um, we want to encourage all activities along this entire spectrum. And that has been accepted by the UN decade as kind of the underpinning principle of, of what is ecosystem restoration. It's the it's the accumulation of all of those different kinds of things that we can do. So if we look at the, um, the UN decade uh, standards of practice, the way that it is organized is into five components, 45 sub subcomponents, and more than 300 different practices that can be uh, deployed in ecosystem restoration. And before I go further, I just want to say that one of the first parts of this process was a stock, taping, a stock taking of all of the standards and the guidance and, and principles that were already out there in the world. So we all we know that there's a whole lot of uh, guidance out there. And so we, um, we, we did some surveys and accumulated all of those things and built these standards of practice, not from scratch, but taking into consideration the vast amount of work that has already been done. So just very quickly, uh, we'll go through the, the components and the way that it's organized. So the first bit is assessment. And you can see that in this particular component, there are five subcomponents. Some of these subcomponents, like broad engagement, are cross-cutting. So you will find them in all of the components of the standards of practice. Um, others are unique to that component. So in this particular case, we have broad engagement and assessment of site conditions. Again, the assessment of the landscape or seascape context as we see from the principles, I'm doing baseline monitoring so that we know what the condition of the site is before we get going and the reference models. And I'm not going to go through all of these subcomponents, um, but just to kind of give you an idea of the kinds of, of uh, content that there are in the standards of practice. 
The second component is uh, planning and design. You can see there's a whole number of, of uh, subcomponents that cover all of the processes of, of designing, uh, planning and designing a restoration project in the broad engagement. So there is this, uh, there's this bit that kind of runs through all of these different um, components. After that, there is uh, implementation. Again, a large number of, of uh, subcomponents that we get into um, from the social to the practical um, to the ecological. Then there's ongoing management. So one of the things that we've really worked on over the last several years is to make sure that people understand that restoration and no matter where you are on the restorative continuum, restoration is a long-term process. It's not a short project. It's not where you throw trees in the ground and walk away. It's a long process that you have to engage in. And so the more that we can do out in time that we can plan for and make sure that we have funding and that we're taking adaptive management into consideration and we're looking for um, opportunities for continuous improvement, uh, the better off that we are. And so that kind of thinking you can also see, for example, in the in the new um, Convention on Biological Diversity Global Biodiversity Framework, where the language is now changed from restored to under restoration. So this is super important that we get people to understand that restoration is a long term process. And as we go through that process, we can continue to improve. And then the final um, component is monitoring and evaluation. And um, and uh, so again, without monitoring and evaluation and adaptive management, we really can't we can't achieve the outcomes that we that we might want to. So in terms of, of the content, um, each of the components has um, some introductory uh, text and, and and they include some key points. So for example, um, that we want to, in, in the case of implementation, just as a, as a sample, that we want to maximize net gain for people in nature, that restoration involves innovation and experimentation, and we cannot always predict the outcomes. Sometimes those outcomes are better than we predict. Sometimes they're not as good, or we have setbacks and we need to change. And then, and to maximize learning that um, we have to document what we do so we can learn and we can share that information. So that's just an example of the kinds of key points that you would see in the introductory text to each of the components. Um, just to give you an example of some of the practices, um, taking uh, implementation, looking at broad engagement, so some of the practices would be to uh, include genuine and, and regular collaboration with stakeholders to make sure that there's transparency and communication that to the extent possible that that stakeholders are engaged in the actual restoration activities um, and uh, and that there are equitable incentives and, and remuneration and special attention to indigenous peoples and other rights and knowledge holders. Um, so that's kind of on the social side and on the ecological side, uh, for example, subcomponent 25, we're talking about um, ecological recovery processes and the idea that we want to, you know, we want to do the least amount of work possible. We want to um, to encourage natural regeneration um, and, and reinforce the natural processes that allow ecosystems to, to heal. And the other thing that I wanted to, to bring up is that... Um, the, uh, there was a large Indigenous Peoples consultation, and you'll see a lot of information about of, about the importance of the meaningful involvement with Indigenous people, as well as best practices for engaging them. So the early release of the UN Decade SOPs are on the SER website. Um, I can put the link in the chat um, after I'm done with the talk so that people can access it. Right now, it's a view only, but within the next few weeks, that will be the, the, the final release. All right, so I want to put this uh, UN decade work into context. Um, we're we're all you know deal with different sectors: forestry, forest and landscape restoration, ecological restoration, and so forth. And so, just want to you know reiterate that there's a lot of guidance that operates at the more you know sector level or or very specific biome. I've got a, some feedback here from somewhere. Okay, I think we're good. All right. So I just wanted to um, to say that SER has been working pretty uh, pretty steadily in the, in the policy standards and certification space. 
So we released the 2019 uh, version two of the standards for ecological restoration. We last fall issued uh, standards on um, mine site restoration. We've issued standards on seed based restoration and so forth. Um, we also have a certification program for practitioners, and now we're moving into the project certification space. Um, what I want to emphasize is a lot of this work in terms of guidance development, standards, and certification are operating in a in a global collaborative effort. So most of these programs, um, we're, we're collaborating with other organizations. They could be um, nonprofits. They could be corporate. Um, but almost all of these projects involve more than one actor, and they're meant to be to solve or uh, to address specific issues that we want to um, improve work on. There are a lot of tools in the SER guidance, um, including the, the 2019 standards. Also, there's a restoration project information sharing framework that helps with interoperability of data uh, from restoration projects. And so these tools are being incorporated into some of this other guidance, in this case, um, in the Global Biodiversity Standard. And then this guidance is also um, being pulled up into the, into the global level, for example, for the CBD um, global biodiversity framework and the uh, the the um, sustainable development goals and so forth. That the whole idea is to get all of this different guidance um, moved up so that it can impact and help to implement some of these different programs that people are trying to accomplish at the global level. Okay, the last part of the talk, I'm going to talk about moving into the project certification space. So since 2019. We've been collaborating with um, WWF Spain on the development of standards for the certification of forest restoration projects um, in Spain and, and also the wider um, Mediterranean. And, um, and uh, at SER 2023, Jordi Cortina, who is on the call, um, gave a presentation um, on this process. And so I'm just going to kind of walk through um, the upscaling, uh, the, the process that occurred to date, and also the future upscaling of the certification standards for Mediterranean forest restoration. So the idea here is to pilot a program to verify the quality of field-based restoration projects or forest, for Mediterranean forests in Spain, to work toward developing a certification program, and to expand the certification to other ecosystems and geographies worldwide. So WWF started this process um, in 2011. There's a large number of collaborators that they have been working with in Spain and, um, and issued um, a number of, uh, or two versions through 2019. That version was uh, presented at the SER conference in South Africa in 2019, the same event uh, we launched our own standards. And from that point, we began to collaborate on the development of of the certification standards, um, so this is a, a timeline of of the work that's been done to date, and then um, the version 4.0 that involves a number of authors and a large number of collaborators is um, is finalized. It's just in in production now and will be available in the next few weeks. So one of the things that we did is we we took the 2019 standards and the work that WWF and their and their uh, group their team had uh, had worked on and kind of aligned those things. There was a lot of alignment already. This is something that we're finding in the development of guidance is there actually is a quite a bit of alignment between these different products. So we align those um, to create uh, a version 3.0, and then those uh, we began to field test those, those the standards on our projects on the ground in Spain, and so this is a project in Valencia, and this one in Andalusia, um, and so we've been getting feedback from actual projects so that we can improve the certification standards and and move toward the actual certification process. Very briefly, um, the the WWF SER standards certification standards have an introduction um, that describes why do we need these, you know, why do we need these certification standards? We already have the international standards that SER produced. Why do we need these? Why do we need certification? Um, address some of the issues about about improving assurance and lowering risk and some of the other reasons that people want um, ecological restoration uh, certification. 
um, and then the standards of practice themselves, which we'll see in the next slide. So very similar to the structure of the um, UN Decade SOPs, um, in this case, we have planning and design that includes the assessment component um, and then implementation and then monitoring um, and evaluation and, and ongoing management, including adaptive management. So you can see there's a large number of, of, uh, of uh, issues in the standards that need to be uh, addressed for a project to ultimately gain certification. We've also been engaged in some you know, some economic uh, uh, analysis, and uh, this is work in progress. So these are just some preliminary um, uh, figures, but uh, our team has been evaluating uh, 22 uh, forest restoration projects um, with a, a varying scale of, of, uh, of planning costs and implementation costs that you can see at the top of the slide. And then those have been um, We've used indicators grouped under eight criteria, and some of those are binary, they're yes, no, and others are, are evaluated onto a zero to three star scale. And what's been found to date is that there's a positive correlation between planning and design costs and project quality, but no correlation between plan implementation costs and project quality. There is an increase in cost um, in the planning uh, and design phase in order to achieve um, a higher start rating. But what has not been done today, for example, um, is to see if, for example, additional costs in design and planning lead to lower costs in implementation. So there's this is just preliminary, um, and this work is uh, ongoing. So some next steps: we will be um, uh, we're in the process right now of evaluating how to move, move to the next step, developing the business model for certification for certification by SER developing policy briefs. Um, there will be some presentation and workshops with the Spanish uh, regional governments. We are collaborating on a project in the High Atlas in Morocco to see how the, the certification standards crosswalks with that work there. Um, and then we are in the process of developing a focus group to help develop certification standards that would be valid for the Mediterranean basin and globally as well as setting up focal groups in other geographies um, to see how these standards can help uh, to, to move towards certification in those regions and also toward a global product. And then I've been asked to invite everyone to the SER Europe's um, 2024 meeting. And with that, I will close my presentation. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you very much, George, for this broad overview about the activity within the ecological restoration activities of SER. So I would like to ask perhaps the audience for some short questions uh, related to the understanding of the presentation. Are there some questions to the, to the content and the understanding? Um, Andres, we have no question now in uh, Q&A session. Okay, but sorry. I think that people thought that it's uh, towards the end. Maybe it's my mistake. I didn't announce that we can have questions between the two. So maybe we can move uh, with Mikael and leave the Q&A until the end. Yeah, thank you, Magda, for, for this information. Yes, but, but I would like also to uh, have a short, uh, or say some words perhaps about the idea why do we have two presentations here? Uh, you have seen and, and, and you heard about more or less uh, the principle of uh, the ecosystem restoration. But in particular, we think about um, also forest restoration. There are also other guidelines or ideas or approaches on forest landscape restoration, for example. They are, in, I think, in, in many parts um, or many aspects also consistent, but there might be also some differences. And due to this, um, it's it's really interesting, and and I'm really glad to be able to introduce Michael Kleine to you. Michael is uh, the deputy executive director of the UFRO, so the Union of Forest Research Organization, but also uh, the coordinator of the UFRO SPDC, which is the special program for development of capacities, and this is very much devoted to the idea to 
increase uh, yeah, the capacities, uh, the scientific, but also the practical capacities, especially in, in less developed uh, countries in the global south. And this is also very much linked also to the idea of um, forest restoration and uh, forest landscape restoration. So Michael is a silviculturist, but also especially, especially on, on forest uh, landscape restoration. He has worked in many, many projects uh, with the focus in, in the tropical and subtropical regions. And uh, so I guess I know, Michael, that also one idea of you three to get in contact with the people and uh, also look on the social background of the people really to get them engaged into a project to give uh, to, to, to lead this uh, to, to, to success. So um, it's good to have you here. And also, I guess, not only me, but also the, uh, the audience is also keen on hear your yeah, ideas on ec ecosystem restoration. So the floor is yours, Michael. Well, thank you very much, Andreas, for this very nice introduction. Dear colleagues, uh... Greetings from you for headquarters in Vienna. Um, of course, thank you very much for the invitation to join this restoration talk. Um, as we have now as our topic, the uh, ecosystem restoration standards uh, and guidelines, um, I thought it might be a good addition to these comprehensive standards and guidelines which are good to have, and, and particularly in the decade of ecosystem restoration, uh, it's important also maybe to bring in some aspects which um, are based on experiences from, from our work in very, very different countries on more forest-related um, restoration and forest landscape restoration work. Um, of course, there are quite a, definitely many overlapping issues, but these aspects I selected um, are also challenges, not only challenges for forest-related restoration, but also challenges in more landscape and uh, restoration of other ecosystems. They are common to many, many ecosystems, actually, where restoration work and uh, making these landscapes more resilient are relevant. So in this regard, I would like to, to share my screen and uh, just give me a second. Um, yes, I would like to, I hope you can see the screen. Very good. Thank yes, you. Very good. Thank you. And I um, had the chance over the last two weeks to, to see um, the summary report of the new SER and uh, prepared by FAO standards um, um, on yeah, standard of practice to guide um, ecosystem restoration. I have not seen the detailed report just George has, uh, has mentioned, um, but by reading the, the summary report, um, it sparked some ideas and some, some thinking of some of the aspects which I have actually have put together, um, six aspects which I think are essential aspects to be considered in, and you can see here in forest-related restoration guidelines, but this in brackets, forest-related, it also would apply to a much wider restoration uh, guidelines for other ecosystems. But of course, please bear with me, these guidelines are not complete. Also, it, these uh, aspects I just took out I just wanted to highlight these and they may be also then subject of discussion and some debate uh, later in these talks. I think I don't need to explain to you the debates over concepts and approaches on very, very different and historically developing um, um, yeah, reforestation, afforestation and uh, restoration um, concepts starting from afforestation, rewilding, uh, to integrated landscape management, to forest landscape restoration, but also lately to um, nature-based solutions, ecosystem-based adaptation, and so on. We can see in the definitions, as well as in the description and how they develop actually over time, that ultimately, they all want to ensure a socially just, climate neutral and nature positive world. So I think that's the target we are actually aiming at. 
And this is common for all these concepts. But of course, there are differences. They come from different perspectives, from different communities. On one hand, from the very, very um, conservation community to more management-oriented forest, land use, agriculture communities. Yeah? So from different perspectives. And, um, but the ultimate aim is to have these resilient, so climate neutral, climate resilient, but also multifunctional landscapes in future, which actually meet the social requirements for society as well as can be sustained in ecological terms and are functioning. The first aspect I would like to bring in, and which is of course also a challenge, is landscapes represent moving targets. What does it mean? And I think uh, it is understood that landscapes are always in transitions, driven by factors, by ecological factors, because the ecosystems are evolving, they're eroding, they are maturing, so they change, but there are social factors, cultural, traditional institutions, but also economic factors in terms of livelihood requirements, uh, uh, management of the vegetation, markets, trades, all influence. But they shape the current landscape today. And obviously we have here um, deficiencies in the current landscape, which should, on the right side, the future landscape should change but it's a moving target. It will also change without interventions. So restoration, call it landscape restoration, ecosystem restoration, ecological restoration is always an intervention into a complex social ecological system. And I think this we need to keep in mind because our measures to be taken yeah, are multifaceted and they can spark positive and negative effects on that moving landscape or in the transitions from the current to the future. And that actually brings us the challenge of entry points, where to start now in this moving landscape where people are working, where climate is affecting, where um, conditions are moving, where to find entry points to the restoration interventions. This can be like here, the two uh, the examples from our work in Malawi, trees on farmlands, to try to bring farmlands to more ecological sound farming, to fight droughts by integrating native trees. On the other hand, energy saving, to save existing forests, to reduce the burden on firewood production in terms of uh, cook stoves, or to start with the youth in schools, to build green schools, to make a kind of environmental awareness of people the importance of trees and um, um, tree landscapes and uh, forest, uh, forest landscapes um, to have benefits uh, for society. So that would be an important issue that landscapes are in transition and we need to find the right entry point with have impact with these entry points and then try to find to make a positive impact on the move of these transitions. The second aspect I would like to float here is stakeholders may have different views of the same reality. That means restoration is a social process. And I would like to see that in guidelines, in any of the guidelines, it is upfront explicitly shown that that social process needs somehow to be facilitated, guided, and influenced so that land management, how man, people manage land, how companies manage land, how it is exploited and of course degraded is actually being positively influenced in a restorative manner. Therefore, to demonstrate that kind of process, it's here the FLR process, uh, forest landscape restoration process shown, of course, from visioning to sustaining, but that's not an um, a straightforward process. It's a revolving process of feedback, of co-developing objectives, assessing the reality, 
seeing the deficiency, seeing the differences of stakeholders in their views, coming up with a sub-project in different ways, getting some results, but having actually the feedback and revolving along this kind of work um, towards at working uh, adaptively towards a future landscape. Even in one loop, I show you here as a cross section, each of these loops actually is always informing, getting stakeholders together, setting objectives together, plan together, decide what to do, motivate those to come in, others motivate others actually to join, organize, steer, control, and see what is the impact, what the results, and again, inform and start the whole process again. So that social process dimension, I think, should be very, very much upfront and visible in, in any guidelines uh, so that people know what they're actually getting in, in actually doing multi-stakeholder processes for, for restoration. The third aspect I would like to put to the table here is assessing the regeneration or envisioning a positive future. The question, of course, would be, um, when we look here at this, where are you in the landscape? We can, of course, on the left side, you can see an ideal picture with all the pristine um, ecosystems from the cloud forest, the upper hill dip to cloud forest, down to the mangroves. So the rich to reef concept where these vegetations still exist, but they do not exist in reality or in very, very small parts of the world. Much more common is the right side of this graph where you can see the environment where people are living. You know, a world with 1 billion people must be different than today, a world with 9 billion people, where you have living zones, agriculture zones, um, and only the forest is very much on top in this, in this picture here. So influenced by um, human interventions and human work since many, many centuries. And that brings us actually to the situation where we create or have created novel ecosystems, agroforestry systems, urban forests. Forests actually are um, vegetations which cannot anymore be uh, modeled after the pristine environment in the past, yeah? but there are... Uh, and should be, as we said here on the right side, best mix of ecosystem services in the future under uncertainty, provide these services, but they might not look the same as a pristine environment, which was there maybe 100, 200 or 300 years ago. So the task in front of all those restoration processes would be emphasis on defining a desired future landscapes rather than to restore or to try to recover to an earlier historical state. Now more towards planning. What would be important is aspect four, different levels of planning matter. That means from landscape to individual sites. So we need to get this right. What is a more landscape planning together with all stakeholders in difference to individual sites? And I think it's very logical that on one hand, we deal with landscape, captures watersheds, jurisdiction, and included land use mosaics. Yeah, Because even the restoration of one small parcel is influenced by the other parcels. Polluted water comes into the mangroves. So to restore mangroves is not sufficient that site at the mangrove, but needs to be addressed in other land parcels as well. The next would be then the land parcel here, the forest as well as then within this forest, individual restoration sites. So the planning needs to distinguish between two, these levels. So to make it easier in a result-based management to set the goals properly with not measurable, but they are long-term, but then to define local objectives, which are measurable in the short and medium term, as well as the activity. Yeah, which are a secret list of what, when, by whom, at what costs, but reconciled with the overall goals at the landscape level and the local objectives at the 
the um, parcel level or at the sub um, landscape level to, to get these levels right. Aspect number five, integrating restoration into an adaptive measures framework means connecting restoration work with ongoing management. Remember, our landscape is in transition continuously from A to B. Even if we don't do anything, the landscape will change. But of course, we are convinced the landscape needs interventions to actually have a better outcome in terms of restoration, functional ecological integrity, if we compared to a situation where we don't do that. Anthropogenic disturbances and natural successions are actually in that graph, and this is a, a conceptual model shows that it can go in all directions from old growth forest to succession forest because of logging. It can go down to agriculture, oil palm plantations, forest plantation, but it can recover. It can be created in terms of afforestation, agroforestry, community, social forestry. It can have succession again. So very, very mix of systems creating ecosystems, creating forest types, creating land, uh, uh, vegetation types yeah, in a, in a rather complex, and this depends of course on the historical development um, of, of these sites in the local context um, are very, very um, difficult to, to actually to, um, to steer, but we need to try to pursue an adaptive approach where we, because reality is too complex to tackle everything on the very beginning and in one. We need to have an adaptive measure where we integrate adaptive forest management. Here's the example of forest management and landscape restoration. First of all, by doing forward looking, preserve, develops ecological functionality based on changing environmental conditions, what is anticipated because of climate change, for example, and production of broad range of ecosystem goods and services. Yeah, so the adaptation, but in, here called adaptive measures, yeah, to adapt, to learn, and then to find new ways, innovative ways actually with the stakeholders to react to these things, to improve in ecological terms, but also in economic and social terms actually is the task in front. And this should actually be uh, upfront also be very ex ex explicitly mentioned in guidelines. And the final um, aspect I would like to float, which is actually a learning process. System-wide capacity for restoration and sustainable land use is required. And this means learning of, for, of everybody in this whole arena of restoration. Of course, there are individual capacities, there are organizational capacities, and they have an impact on the enabling environment, which allows them for uh, sustainable land use or working towards sustainable land use and restoring to field implementation. But in that huge, let me say, arena of capacities, there are three aspects very important. We distinguish between a governance space in FLR. It's fundamental to creating the long-term enabling conditions for moving the landscape towards a positive restored or, or better environmental quality, local to international levels and comprised of actors and institutions involved in decision-making. So shaping this governance space. Secondly, very logical, shaping this implementation space. Various stakeholders act to restore. Role, interests, and preferences of local stakeholders are fundamental, as well as incentives must outweigh, outweigh disincentives. But what is missing in between is here the facilitation space. These processes don't happen on its own. It's a critical intermediary to leverage change. And that needs a lot of efforts in both directions to the implementers, the local actors, and those in the governance space. Yeah? FLR facilitation requires landscape leadership skills. And some of our experience with mentorship programs to actually create and to train FLR facilitators. Uh, we did this in Sri Lanka and Malawi and 
it will continue this in Central and Southern America uh, from next year onwards has been uh, yielded quite good results to drive that social process towards forest landscape restoration um, and restoration overall. Well, to conclude, I would like, of course, most of the things I presented is more or less connecting restoration work to the landscape. Secondly, connecting to land management, because land management will go on and will drive the transition from A to B. And we want to reach a B, which looks better in ecological, social, and economic terms compared to today. But we should not forget that restoration is not an end in itself. Yeah? but a means to achieving resilient landscapes that are more beneficial to people and nature. So it's the way to a more a landscape which is less degrading and which is more providing more benefits to people and nature yeah, and not an end in itself. And of course, with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you and back to you, Andreas. Yes, thank you very much, Michael, for this really also bright uh, broader insight in more or less these aspects of forest landscape restoration and, and more. Yes, <clears throat> if I'm right, we have no questions in the Q&A in the moment, but perhaps I can stimulate the discussion a bit with a bit provoking analysis. So I look more or less on the presentation of you, George, and you, Michael, it seems a bit for me, and this is of course a very simplified um, a perception, that is some fact that a more ecocentric approach of you, John, versus a sociocentric approach of you, Michael. So what would you answer to, <laughs> to, to such a perception or, or a statement? Who would you like to tackle that first? Well, ecology first, George, please. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think that the, the difference it really is that um, ecological restoration has the mandate that there is recovery of, of uh native or natural ecosystems that that's what ecological restoration is all about however when we look at the standards that has to be done in the context of improving human well-being taking you know having meaningful interaction with stakeholders and so forth because we all know that projects have gone on in the past that have been harmful to people and and that's not the way that's not the way we want to do things right ecosystem restoration the broader concept um, as it's defined by the UN, actually requires both improvements in nature and human well-being. So if you look at the definitions and the guidance for the for the decade, we want to achieve both of those things. So in in my mind, um, ecological restoration requires the recovery of native or natural ecosystems, ecosystem, restoration requires improvements in for nature and people, which could include functions, right? But in general, if you improve functions, you're going to also improve biodiversity, but but not always. Um, the the issue with FLR from 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 my view is that um, you're you're trying to create resilient landscapes that are good for people and nature may benefit, but it's not necessarily a pre prerequisite. Um, so, for example, Michael showed um, the idea that we want a, a, a carbon or climate neutral um, outcome, right? So, um, so the the emphasis is on other things, and we want to get at least to, car to to carbon neutral, and that's a good thing, and we support that. However, um, what we we think we need more we need we need climate positive um outcomes not just climate neutral outcomes for example so anyway that's just uh off off the top to your provocative question <laughs> thank you and and michael what what would be your question well i think um agreed i mean on one can you hear me yeah um 
I think people in the past, and we all have degraded landscapes, degraded forests, and more and more degraded these, these landscapes and, and these ecosystems. And the reasons, and these are driving the drivers and these forces behind, of course, need to change so that a more non-degrading land use will allow that ecological recovery in whatever form. Yeah? And, and of course, the let me say the, the nature-based knowledge, what we need from nature and to, to um, in terms of biodiversity levels, in terms of water quality, nutrient cycles, and so on, definitely needs to be um, re restored in, in many different ways, actually, to make part of an of an, a landscape where, where people live and work and and um, get also their food and their firewood and all their uh, goods and services from. Definitely. That means that learning process, which I showed, yeah, must, of course, incorporate all the knowledge jo George has just mentioned, yeah, uh, as an information and a decision base also to better manage the landscape as it has been done in the past. Yeah? So there are, of course, many, many innovative ways actually to, to manage land, which is less degrading. Um, it is ultimately, of course, that if we reach a landscape, a landscape management where we have, um, let us say, uh, talk about um, regeneration, we talk about uh, let me say, mild so-called degradation, which is then um, a kind of a, a kind of uh, rejuvenation of the system in terms of natural regeneration, in terms of producing, um, let, us, let us say, uh, in multi-stories with a high biodiversity level in the landscape. I think this should be the ultimate aim. So we need that ec ecological knowledge, no doubt, but it's still driven by people and the decisions they make even if it's illegal, or even if the laws and the regulations say something else, no? if the need is there, people will do this and they will actually uh, encroach and they will uh, do harm to the environment. So therefore, of course, that approach to go more from the social side first, I think, is, is one to try to, to, to work with the drivers. No? But of course, no doubt, the ecological knowledge definitely is the base for, for any action to be taken. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Andreas, I have a burning question. And um, didn't stop thinking about the loop. I liked very much that it's not like a consultation process in the start of the project, but we keep this loop ongoing all the time. But then this dynamic system and this moving target make it maybe much more difficult for certification. I mean, how can we certify something that moves always? And it's something we have discussing with, with Priscilla uh, uh, about it. So how, how difficult is it? I know that for indicators, for example, at each um, um, uh, step in our restoration process, even indicators to find how good is our, our ecosystem today is challenging. What about uh, certification? So if you have a question, George, yeah, sure. No, it's a great it's a great question. So, one one of the things that we have to uh, recognize that Michael very correctly brought up is that um, nature changes and has always changed, right? So, if you if you dig into the uh, into the standards around um, restoration, either ecosystem or or ecological, then um, there is a recognition of, of this process that we have always had, and we always will have a moving target in terms of what the ecosystem becomes. And if you actually look at, at the SER 2019 standards, the, the language in there is that uh, very clearly, A, we're not going backwards in time, we're going forward, right? And, um, and that our job as restoration practitioners is to create the conditions where nature can evolve and adapt and reassemble in the face of climate change. So for certification to work, we, we don't want to get stuck on predefined concepts of what the ecosystem will look like, but rather to create reference 
models that allow us to see what what that might be in the future, but to create conditions of adaptive management that allow us to continuously reassess what's going on um, in the ecosystem, in the in the landscape, you know, um, in the region with regard to changes that are going to occur with rainfall and temperatures and, and so forth, um, but also changing social conditions. So what people want, the future that they envision um, may change over time too. So one, one of the things that we know and that you'll see in, in, in the guidance is that um, what, what people may have wanted at the beginning of a restoration project may not be what they want you know, five years down the road or 10 years down the road and restoration is long is a long process. So the, the issue of certification is really one in which you create the conditions where you can have goals and objectives. You have monitoring, you're seeing how you're doing. Are you getting closer to your reference? You're taking a look at changes in the system and you're adapting to those. And then as you have in the FLR process, you have these feedback loops where you go back to the communities and you assess, how are we doing? Is this still what you want? Are we still on track ecologically? Are we still on track socially and, and, and economically? And then you agree on, on the changes that may be necessary to put the project um, in a direction so that it's continuing to improve with the understanding that you're continuously trying to improve uh, conditions for nature and people, right? And so that's you know that that's the issue from from my end. Um, in terms of the FLR process itself, um, there's uh, we're aligned. I mean, it, it's the the only uh, again the, the the tools might be slightly different, the, and the objectives might be slightly different, but but FLR and and the guidance on on ecosystem restoration or ecological restoration are very closely aligned. Yeah. Thank you. Andreas, we have uh, Jordi Cortina for SER. Yes, and, and and yes, and thanks. And you know, switch off the camera. This was also <laughs> my idea. So Jordi, please ask a question. So th th thanks a lot for letting me jump into the conversation. Uh, I, I just wanted to highlight what George mentioned at the end that is this so the alignment is so uh, so high. I mean, there's still some differences, but uh, I think we agree. Uh, and it's, you know, from Don, Don Quixote, there's this discussion when there are some dogs chasing Don Quixote and, and they are discussing about, oh, they may be this type of dogs or the other type of dogs, and they are not running <laughs> as, as they should. So I, I think if we agree on the, on the basics, but still uh, many projects are still failing uh, in many aspects, uh, I, I just will mention monitoring uh, the the deadline for the project. We are still pretending to restore ecosystems in two three years, and that's not possible. We are failing to to carry out uh, participatory processes that are operational. So my question would be: Okay, we we agree on the basics. How can we translate these into practice? And and Foster high quality restoration. Thank you very much. Also on this, so yeah. it's I think more a comment. So, but I would like also to ask Michael if you if you want to. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I would like to highlight a little bit what Superb is doing um, as this regard. You know, as a. Um, in our core business, we have the ecological part, making sure that we have uh, talking about the trees, which trees from where, etc. But we have also um, the social component is really very important, and also the governance component, and then how we can fund all our uh, all our work. I mean, for us, uh, we are also having this principle about looking forward and not looking. To the um, to the past and how they should look like, but we're trying to restore function, the function and the resilience of the forest in um, facing climate change. And this is where why you are talking about restoration. And uh, I can also announce that we will have an EU a conference next year, uh, a session on, on this. So for us, the resilience and diversity is a key for our ecological um, uh, strengths. 
of the forest or uh, for the ecosystem we are restoring. Um, so in the certification of this, can you go and handle, are you handling this uh, this topic? Are you handling, are you going until the species diversity and genetic diversity of the species you are, we are talking about? So the diversity at the landscape, at species and level. Sorry, I turned off my computer, my audio. George. Yeah, absolutely. So um, if you look at the um, five-star system in the, in the ecological recovery wheel, so there's two recovery wheels in, in the SER standards that are, are very uh, helpful. One is the ecological recovery wheel. The other is the social benefits wheel. And um, the, the ecological recovery wheel has six key attributes and composition, which um, include um, components of diversity is, is one of those key attributes, structure as well, and, and, and so forth. So when you create um, when you create the reference model of of what you want to what you want to see in the future, and this can include also um, agroforestry systems or, or other systems that include native species, then you absolutely must address the issue of diversity, both at you know in terms of the um, the species level, the genetic level, the landscape level, and so forth, uh, as it pertains to the ecosystem that you're is the target of your of your restoration, and. Um, and so these these bits will be included in in evaluating the plan that is developed as part of certification, right? So does this does the project have a, a plan that has a target? Does the target have a reference model? Does that reference model include the biodiversity components, the structural components, and so forth that help us to determine um, whether we're achieving the um, the objectives that would relate to resilience as you just described it? So absolutely. Thank you, George. We have a question from Mikael Ingolby. Mikael, you can ask your yeah. question. Ah, attends, Mikael, sorry, Mikael Klein, you have a uh, yeah, just before. Sorry, sorry, guys. I just wanted to, <clears throat> to, to add, because you already asked the question about these projects, huh? that they are not too short and is never, never actually the problem. And of course, we know that in the whole restoration process, a project is nothing, one project. Yeah? So we need these long-term um, uh, horizon, but we need to create stakeholders. That means the, those have access rights, who are the owners, who are the guardians of, of these lands and inbuilt this kind of, uh, uh, let me say, knowledge, as well as also the aspiration to go further and restore land or manage land in a non-degrading way and then gradually to improve. No? So that means that's part of, of the whole process actually to deal with with, uh, with, with stakeholders and also to, to learn those facilitators coming from outside and those within uh, the communities that this is an objective by itself for them and not actually, of course, dictated from outside. As far as certification is concerned, although in the beginning, of course, uh, two weeks ago, I said we will not uh, comment as a science organization on any certification, but the only um, answer, uh, Mark, to, to your question, in my view, is it's always a difference whether you certify the restoration outcome. As, as George explained, there must be some concrete you know, targets or you certify the process. Mm -hmm. huh? So the, the, um, the um, ISO 14000 is a process management system or an, an, a management certification of a process. It doesn't talk about the outcome. Huh? So that would be um, simply to be decided whenever it comes to certification. Thanks. Thank you, Mikhail. And now we move to the other Mikael with your question, Mikael Ingolby, if I pronounce it right. Yeah, near enough. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's a question really about action at the sharp end. If you come across a population who strongly and repeatedly resist your ideas of improvement because they see them as a threat to profit or their way of life or religious belief or whatever, and they are determined not to take up your ideas, what do you do? Do you ever resort to saying it is for your own good and the government says, or do you hold up your hands and admit defeat? Well, okay, just may I, may I first just, just um, 
I think definitely a very important question, and that happens um, in 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 definitely also in in many places. But that's actually the the beauty of a consultation process within the communities, uh, and it's a long term where nothing happens actually in terms of landscape change, in terms of restoration, but communities and actors have to come together to define this themselves. Um, it's not a matter to impose something from outside, it's a matter of informing, discussing, and identifying what's lacking. You know, sometimes we we we, we saw that, and, and it's very, very clear that local actors know exactly why the landscape look like it looks today. They are missing certain services from clean water to too high erosion to, to less productivity. So one needs to find an entry point where an interest, a vested interest, and from there to start slowly to improve things, not even to talk about the big um, aims of restoration, even in biodiversity conservation, and so on, but start with those things where people identify, well, this is something we need to improve because um, uh, the water quality and the quantity is en not enough and certain things which are really an interest by, by, by local actors and from there to slowly uh, work further. That can take a long time, I know, and, and, but that's actually the, the process which uh, needs to start to avoid that it is felt an imposition from outside. Thank you. Yeah, so to follow up, um, I, I agree completely, right? We can't have top-down mandates um, to get what we want. Uh, we have to communicate, we have to have outreach, we have to educate and to understand, right? We need to listen to what is going on at the local level so that we can understand why people are making the decisions that they're making. Um, that said, um, you know, we're at a tipping point globally in terms of biodiversity, in terms of climate and so forth. So the the issue of having those conversations and figuring out how to move things forward in a productive way with local communities is becoming imperative. So um, so the idea of, you know, should we do it from the top down? No. Should we walk away in defeat? No. We have to we have to do the other bit. We have to do the hard work of talking and listening and coming up with a solution that protects biodiversity, recovers um, natural attributes, functions, and services, and so forth, in a way that is um, engaging and, and and productive for all concerned. And do you always reach consensus? Well, not necessarily in our lifetime. <laughs> I mean, you know, some some things are going to take. Restoration takes long periods of time, and so does, you know, state. So does engagement. So does listening. Yeah, I'm, I'm a forester, so I think in long term. Thank you. Thank you, Mikhail. Um, I have also another question sent by by a colleague asking about who will be using the certification system, who will pay for it. Is this something that should be adopted by the funders, or because like what happens with the carbon certification, for example, very often the expert who will come and verify take a lot, a lot of money and we are barely finding money to restore. So who will afford the certification process implementation? Right, so um, so working on a couple of different levels, we're working with colleagues from Botanic Gardens Conservation International on the Global Biodiversity Standard, and then also on the SER project certification that we've discussed. And in both cases, we're not trying to create a product that is expensive and unreachable. Um, we want to create products that um, small uh, restoration projects that are um, that are interested in, in in elevating their brand or their work, getting recognition for good work, can afford to to uh, to engage in. So it's this is not carbon credits or biodiversity credits or or things like that. This is. Um, this is aspirational and it's volunteer, you know, voluntary. Um, what we what we have have seen in conversations with with funders and with corporate uh, with corporates and so forth is that um, people want assurance that their money is being well spent. 
So I think ultimately, if we, if we can create standards, certification processes that are reasonable from a financial perspective, that increase assurance, that reduce risk, then I think that there will be the money available to do that because it's just going to be good business, right? Right now, it's kind of a free-for-all, and um, there's not necessarily um, a good mechanism for knowing that the outcomes are going to be you know, what you thought you were investing in. And so certification can help to, you know, help funders, um, whether they be self-funded or external funding can help funders, businesses to, to uh, have a better idea that they're going to get positive outcomes, right? And so that's, uh, we're, we're still working on the business model. We don't have a, you know, we don't have a, you know, a precise and complete answer to your question, but these are the kinds of questions that we're asking, right? How can we create this, um, certifi this certification uh, process in a way that is going to be good business for the for the applicants and 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 for others that um, want those assurances. And are you working on um, educating or uh, offering training for for the young people, for example, to get trained and so they can work on applying this certification and uh, train themselves at some point? Um, absolutely, and so. Um, on the on the global biodiversity standard, which is a little bit further along in the process, for example, um, there is a you know we're, the the mechanism is training the trainers is to figure out you know how can we train people that can train others and then this means having you know um, uh, uh, well written guidance about about the training process itself and mentoring and so forth and and importantly and and this will well, this will be also true of the of the SER certification. Um, is that we will link this to the certified ecological restoration practitioner um, training and certification. So we want to elevate the number of people in the world, the practitioners um, that are out there that can contribute to these kinds of projects and for people to be able to know that they exist. Um, and so we're integrating um, the certification of, of practitioners into these processes so that we can do that. And get practitioners in every country so that the you know the knowledge base is there for people to understand better how to design and implement and monitor um, restoration projects. Great, thank you, Mikael. Well, I would like to to add, of course, not on certification, but I would like to add, of course, that um, the issue of uh, what are the costs involved yeah, in managing land, of course, is central, but. Even if you balance and say, well, we do and take some of those ecological requirements and implement in some piece of land, uh, but still um, getting um, returns out of it, yeah, of course, which maybe uh, lessen the, the margins, but still is acceptable, is one way actually to internalize costs for good environmental management. I, I know that that um, uh, because the world is the world should not be on one hand restoration which only costs money and and is only for the philanthropic sector and the the rest is business and we simply go for profit maximization. If we continue with that, actually the world will go bust because because uh, uh, the resources needed and the fiber and and all those what is even for a green economy uh, somehow needs to come from somewhere. So we need actually also to make systems workable, which are of course more a little bit more costly, but serve a lot of biodiversity, carbon, uh, and other ecological requirements to improve land management. Thanks. Thank you, Miguel. Andreas? Yes, thank you very, for the very interesting uh, discussion. Um, I would like to also stress this um, yeah, idea of participation and top down and bottom up, but because I think, shouldn't we be honest if we are writing a, a guideline for ecological restoration or forest landscape restoration, uh, mainly, you know, authored by uh, experts from the Northern Hemisphere, and we're going down to the global south. It is, of course, a top-down approach. We have to be honest with this. So, but then it's very important to have how can we stimulate more or less also the, the people, uh, you know, uh, the, the local people there, because often, as uh, Michael already said, that they even know what they want, 
and and how to more or less stimulate more or less to get into this also button up or you know integrative process but yeah that, but but i'm i'm not quite sure if we really should should um, pretend that we are more or less not in a top down process if we are talking about principles uh, um, and the other point is also and perhaps also on michael how can we also get more people from the global south into the driver's seat of such uh, um, uh, yeah, drafting guidelines and so on? Because I guess they have more or less of the, they, they have the, 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 the local knowledge and, and also they really know the best, the, the problem, what we have in the, in the global south. And, and this is perhaps also really a challenge. Andreas, a very good question. Our experience is, for example, Sri Lanka and Malawi that our colleagues there, of course, they, they are aware of these guidelines, but they simply develop their own ones based on some of these ideas. So we have now actually a kind of uh, landscape restoration from the Sri Lankan point of view in Sinhala and Tamil, which is actually in the, their languages for their officers, for their professionals there, and the same in Chicheva in Malawi. But there are more or less Philip pieces taken out from the guidelines and put them together in a context which they feel is understandable, it is uh, suits the way, which is completely different between Malawi and, and Sri Lanka, but adapted to the local situation. So we did not involve any more in, in, in these local discussions, but of course we support this project and we, we also of course can see the results in the ways they would like to do. And if the outcome is, is positive in the direction we think that landscape should improve, then of course um, it's even the, the better. So the, I think the world is changing, but still, of course, taking your note in consideration that we need to be careful no, with setting standards from the north or from 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 our from our perspective, rather than to uh, to let me say to to get these things developed and 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 simply float them and discuss and and uh, and nurture those things we 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 think are important and they get them to their own decisions. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So to follow up on that, um, first of all, a, a very good observation, but there's a big difference between the development of guidance um, that is out there for people to, to, to use, digest, throw away, and, and top-down decision-making or mandates, right? Big difference. And so the latter we have to avoid. Now, in terms of is this guidance coming from the global north? Um, uh, yes, in terms of of the proportions of people that work on these things, that is absolutely a good criticism. However, um, SER has been particularly uh, concerned about this issue, and we have made sure since the 2019 version of the SER standards that that we have worked hard to include people, um, colleagues from the from the global south. A bigger problem, I would argue, as a practitioner, is it's a whole lot easier to get academics from the global south than it is to get practitioners from anywhere in the world. So getting practitioner input on, the, on this bit is actually a bigger problem, and that's a global problem. It's not just a problem in the global south. It's a problem in Europe. It's a problem all over. Um, so um, we're, we're aware of this and attentive to that and, and working hard to, to reach out. We will continue to do that with our with our uh, with our projects to make sure that we have global representation. Um, the first version of the SER Re ecological restoration standards in 2016 had four authors from Australia and the United States, and the second had 16 authors from five continents, um, specifically done to address this issue that you bring up. Um, also, to point out, on terms of the the UN Decade standards of practice, same thing major work was done to make sure that it was inclusive and global. And the Indigenous Peoples Consultation in particular um, was specific to address this problem of making sure that this guidance was not top-down guidance from the global north. So I think that we are aware, we are working. Is it perfect? Absolutely not. Is there more work that needs to be done? Absolutely. But uh, first, you have to acknowledge that the problem exists, and then you have to do something about it. And I would argue that we are, in fact, doing something about it. Thanks, George. Perhaps one question. So uh, I think it's very interesting point on this academic bias. So um, 
what do you think is the reason is this cultural uh, uh, is it more a language or social aspects that plays a role that you cannot reach or or the the, the practitioners are not reached like like the academics so i mean first of all there are academic practitioners right so we're more likely to get academic practitioners or people that work for large NGOs who are practitioners, not necessarily academics, um, than we are to get uh, people that are spending, you know, ninety percent of their time in, in in the field. And so there are many issues. Part of it is economic. Most practitioners, you know, running a running a business or running a small NGO and being a practitioner is hard work. It's economically difficult. There's not a lot of extra resources lying around for people to participate in these processes or to even to travel and go to conferences and etc so this is an issue with ser's uh conferences that it's harder to get practitioners than people that work for ngos or uh are, are in academics language is an issue um so uh this is an issue with the standards where we've worked hard to get um uh translations done but we really can't reach everybody unless we can get to their language, right? So uh, there are many, you know, there are many difficulties in terms of getting um, true practitioner participation. Again, we're aware of it, and we're trying to do things in a way that can maximize that participation. But if we really want to get ecological or ecosystem restoration or FLR in the, you know, on the ground um, globally, we we have to. Um, we have to reach people at their level um, within their economy and in their language. And right now we don't have the capacity to do that. This is the aspiration. If I may just take from there, uh, um, Andreas, the the so-called small, but really not very big mentorship program on, on FLR facilitators in Malawi and Sri Lanka created roughly 50 to 80 people in each country uh, knowing about the process, finding it very, very interesting actually to to um, yeah to do these stakeholders and so on um, processes, and then get into the issues anyway. The farmers and everyone in Malawi and Sri Lanka is concerned about yeah because of those uh, uh, droughts and increasing um, weather phenomena, which actually really become very serious for many people there. So there is a need actually to discuss these things. But these facilitators who have been roughly working on these knowledge products and creating their own language products and having these meetings, having these training workshops themselves, without us actually, yeah, they have been engaged by large projects funded from abroad to be the facilitators. Yeah, So they are actually a kind of critical mass of people uh, pursuing this in their own country. Now, this I call a little bit the, the power of local knowledge products, now, where then this is taken up. And this uptake, I think, is our yardstick of being successful or not. Now, that's for us also the boundary where we won't go further in, except we will be asked to come in and to, to further discuss and, and look at things and, and, and so on. So that's a little bit an a small indication of now, what, what knowledge products can do if there are certain um, colleagues in the countries thinking this has a value and they can mold it and, and change it to the, the way they would design their uh, communication and, and their, their process within the countries. Thank you. So, Georgia, I wanted to ask you about, uh, about uh, the Mediterranean. So, I saw that you are testing already time in Spain and in Algeria. You are testing your um, your system. So how is it working? Do you have any promising? Do you want more sites in the Mediterranean that we can help with, or how is it going? Absolutely. So yeah. So outside of Spain, we're working with a with a group in in Morocco, and things have been uh, slowed down a little bit because of the earthquake. But um, um, absolutely, we we would love to um to collaborate with with um with your group and others on the call to identify other sites outside of scene where we can test the, the version 4.0. Um, and, um, you know, people can, um, I guess we have to figure out how people can communicate. Um, I, I can put my email in the, in the chat, um, but absolutely we would, uh, we would love to do that. I, what I'll say is that um, we at SER, we are getting, um, 
a lot of pressure to move on this more quickly, right? So people are really interested in 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 project certification for ecological restoration, and so anything that we can do to collaborate with others that can help move this forward um, in in a meaningful but but uh, but um, maybe a little bit faster than otherwise would occur um, would be really appreciated. So thanks for bringing that up, Magda. Thank you. Andreas, do you have anything to say before before we close or any of uh, of our speakers? Oh, okay, yes, I, I see it. <laughs> I'm already, yes. We are, we, we are near to, to closing time. So uh, thank you to all of you. It was really, I think, an inspiring discussion. And I'm thinking also a bit about have a increased dialogue also between SER and also the, the FLR community, because I think I see very many overlappings, but also perhaps interesting aspects and issues or perspective uh, coming in. So I think that's uh, really inspiring to, to move on with this discussion, I guess, with the, with the two groups. So thank you very much, especially to, to you both of you, George and Michael. And yeah, and I leave it to you, Magda, to, to close the session. Thank you very much. So again, I would like to uh, to thank the presenters for their excellent presentation. Uh, I keep learning from every from every webinar, so we will uh, try each time to reach more and more people and advertise in a in a good way. And I see the opportunity to uh, to send you to ask you to uh, register for our next webinar, which is very promising since it's tackling a very hot topic, which is a nature restoration law that is still under discussion. And uh, yeah, so it's very hot potato now moving moving around and you will have uh, in the framework of SUPERB, our colleague uh, from the University of Fribourg did a very nice study about the coherence or the incoherence between the EU forest related policies under the framework of this nature restoration law. So we will have people from, from different sectors and the panels after the presentation to discuss what does this mean for them, for their country, for their sector, industry-wise or, uh, or even protection-wise. So um, uh, you can visit uh, our social media or maybe we can put the link in the chat today so you can register for our next week. So it's exceptionally not in one month ago, it's only next week on Friday, on Wednesday next week, October 18. So please make sure you, you book your place. And uh, thank you everyone. So um, uh, let me check who's here yet. So Mikael, Andreas, George, and uh, our colleague from EFI supporting the system. Thank you very much and see you next week, hopefully. Thank, thank you. you All Bye -bye. the best. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Marta. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.